Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com, and today we're going to be looking at Johannes Sukertort's Immortal Game, his most famous game. If you're not familiar with him, in the late 1800s, he was the world number two player behind Steinitz, who won uh, the world championship for many years. Uh, and his opponent playing the black pieces is Joseph Blackburn. Both of these players we have many openings named after uh, Blackburn was one of the most dominant British chess players, also top of uh, the chess world in the late 1800s. This tournament's held in 1883 in the London tournament, and it has uh, many of the world champions or the people playing for the world championship around that time, including Steinitz in this tournament. Uh, so very strong uh, tournament. This is uh, not some amateur uh game where you're going to be seeing some crazy moves against uh, some weaker opponents. These are the top players in the world at the time. So Zuckertor playing the white pieces and then Blackburn defending with the black pieces. Zuckertor starts out with pawn to c4. And after pawn to e6 plays pawn e3. Had the option to go queen's gambit line, but instead decides to go with your traditional English opening. Knight f6, knight to f3, and then pawn to b6. Now, different generations like different openings. At this time, it was not very common for both sides to be fianchettoing their bishop here to uh, b7 and g7, kind of playing the hyper-modern defense. Uh, not very common, but that's exactly what Blackburn's looking to do here. Bishop to e2, getting ready to castle on the king side. Bishop to b7, trying to control the center light squares in the board. Castle on the king side, pawn to d5, pawn up here to d4, really controlling these dark squares right now. Bishop to d6, opening up to castle on the king side of the board. Knight to c3, just simple development. Neither side really looking to exchange right away. Castle on the king side, and then pawn to b3. And this is opening up the door for the bishop to come to b2. So, uh, not only is Blackburn opening up the, the repertoire here, trying to try something new because there's not as much theory in opening games, and this is not very popular. Uh, Zucker Tort decides to go ahead and do the same thing, pawn to b3, and preparing for his bishop to come here to b2. Blackburn continues his development, getting his knight involved into the game. Bishop to b2, as we talked about, queen to e7, and development has been completed uh, for Blackburn. The only thing that Zuckertoid has to do is get his queen involved, but decides first to go ahead and play knight up here to b5. Attacking the bishop, we have a lot more theory around the bishop pair, uh, and you can see right away that Zuckertoid realizes how strong this is, so decides to go ahead and attack this bishop right here, and there's no real great square for the bishop to come to, uh, it is going to fall. It wants to maintain control of the c7 square, so he needs to come along this diagonal here. If it comes down here, this is the only safe square, uh, then the knight can just take up here on c7. So recognizing that it is going to fall, decides to go and bring the knight down here to e4. This is a great outpost for the knight. Also, if he wants to come back and take here on d6, he has that option. White decides to go ahead and take here on d6 and then recapture with the pawn here on d6. Now, sometimes you don't want to have a uh, double pawns, uh, but in the center, it's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you have a partner over here uh, on the connecting file. Uh, you can really control a lot of the center of the board. You can see that black controls both the light squares and the pawn here on d6 really controls these dark squares as well. White can't come up here to e5, things like that. This does also open up the door for a semi-open file. So if black wants to bring his rook over here to c8, or it could swing over to over, over here from the f file as well, uh, he can now control that, uh, get his rooks involved into the game. The knight comes back here to d2, recognizing that, yeah, it's not going to be doing much here uh, coming to e5. So wants to position a little bit differently, plays knight here to d2. Knight to f6, just defending uh, the knight here on e4. Uh, does not want to have the knight come to e4 uh, and then take with the pawn. That's not the double pawn he's looking for on the e-file. Uh, doesn't have the protection that he would want from the pawn back here on d6. So the pawn comes to f3. Uh, forcing the knight to move. Could say, yeah, let's go ahead and exchange if you want to. That's exactly what Blackburn decides to do. And then the queen takes here on d2, completing development for white as well. 
Now we start to see some pawns come off the board. Blackburn decides to go ahead and take with his pawn here on c4. This does also get rid of the double pawns here in the center of the board. Bishop takes, just getting that strong uh, light square diagonal up here on c4. This does also allow for the bishop here on b2 and the bishop here on c4 to really control these long diagonals. Right away, we see Blackburn play pawn to d5, just blocking the center of the board. Also wants to make sure that this light square bishop doesn't do too much, so it comes back here to d3. Rook over here to c8, trying to control this now open file completely. And white has a couple options. Could decide to go ahead and uh, counterattack, maybe rook to c1. Uh, and just say, yeah, I don't want you to control that. Uh, Zuckertor decides, yeah, I don't care about that at all and plays Rook over here to E1. Now, this is his immortal game uh, and Steinitz afterwards, since he's at this tournament and they're watching the other players in the competition, see how they're doing. They're reviewing the games as well. Uh, he said this one's the great, one of the greatest chess games of all time. Uh, this is one of those moves that his people are analyzing they look at and recognize uh, just how... Uh, great this move was and what it really led to later on into the game. But really, Zuckertor looked at this and said, yeah, I don't care if you control this open file right here. I want to dominate the center of the board. Uh, and really, with both of my bishops lining up on the king side of the board, I feel like I have a strong attack coming up. So I want to go ahead and put everything I have in that basket. So Rook here to E1. Rook to c7. Have to continue with the game plan. If you're going to control this open file, you have to play rook to c7. You have to swing your rook over here to c8. Double barrel here and try to attack on the queen side of the board. White pretty much has the game plan. I'm going to push forward, try to open up this board state, really attack my opponents. That's what he does. Place pawn to e4, uh, rook to c8. And then pawn to e5, trying to blow up uh, the board as much as possible. The knight forced to move, so knight up here to uh, e8. And then pawn to f4. So it is it is all in now. There's, there's no way to come back from this. Decides to push all of his pawns now forward as much as possible. And then pawn to g6, realizing that stuff's going down, so wants to stop it as much as possible. Rook to e3. So now decides I'm going to get my rook involved. I can swing it over here to the king side, start to attack my opponent. And then pawn down here to f5. Says one right away. I'm going to blow up your uh, pawn structure a little bit. You have one chance and one chance only for en passant. You can actually take right here, which is what happens in the game. And if not, this starts to clog up this side of the board, which is what Blackburn is probably thinking about. Yeah, I'm, I want to clog this up a little bit. And if you take, hey, that's fine. Uh, I have my knight here on e8. You don't want your knight on the eighth rank. So he's looking at it and says, yeah, I'm okay with my knight recapturing here on f6. This is exactly what happens in the game. White looks at this and feels pretty good about it. Plays pawn to f5. Continue as much as possible to try to break up this board state on the king side of the board. Knowing that he has two bishops eyeing down on the king side. He has both of his rooks and a king and a queen. Excuse me. So he just knows if he can start to remove some of this material, he's going to have a strong attack somewhere. Now we see knight down to e4, just as a great little outpost, blocking some of the material here. Probably better bringing the knight here than pawn to uh, f5, because then we have a great little deflection here with the bishop taking uh, the pawn. Can't take here. You can see the queen is going to fall. Maybe the rook comes over here to e8, uh, trying to block something. Uh, but then you could just see rook takes on e6, attacking the queen. Maybe the queen takes, bishop takes. Rook to e6. Uh, there's lots of different options here. Queen up to uh, f4, attacking the rook here on uh, c7. You could have the queen come down here to g3, check. Could eventually, after check, take the pawn here on a7. So lots of variation that these players are looking at. But in the game, decides to go ahead and play knight down here to e4. Bishop takes after the pawn takes, then the pawn takes here on g6. So this is starting to open things up. Another thing this does do is it opens up the door for a discovered attack with pawn to 
d5 and this is going to be very crucial later on in the game so he's blown up the king side of the board and also opening up for a very deadly move of pawn to d5 at some point knowing that his opponents could eventually get his king on one of these dark squares so after the pawn to uh g6 then we see rook down here to c2 and h takes on g6 it's just not really that good of a move after rook to g3 really hard uh, for black to do anything productive uh, in this spot so we do see correctly uh, that blackburn defends uh, he plays the rook down here to c2 now white continues with the same thing as before and we see pawn takes here on h7 and then the king comes over here to h8, recognizing that as soon as he, he takes this, uh, then the queen and the rook can start to come over here to the king side of the board and attack. He's almost using this pawn as a defense for himself. Now, what we looked about before is there's still that discovered attack with pawn to uh, d5. And that's exactly what we see here uh, with check. So saying, yeah, uh, you can go ahead and take my bishop if you want to. I'm just going to go ahead and take your rook right here, but does have to figure out how he's going to defend this. Decides to go ahead and play pawn to uh, e5. It would have been tough if he takes with his rook here on uh, b2. The queen's going to take here. This is going to be check. Maybe pawn to e5 at this point. It's going to take material here on uh, e4. Then queen down here to c5, uh, check king over here to h1 this is a very good square uh, but you can see that white has a dominant position is up multiple pawns uh, does have two rooks uh, and the queen here the rook can take up on e5 this should be a pretty easy game for uh, for white to do and you can see even if the queen comes down here to d2 uh, queen is being able to protect this so if the bishop takes this is going to be a pretty easy uh, in game for white. So as we come here after pawn to d5, we see instead the pawn to e5. So it really comes down to can white remove this pawn here on e5? Because there is a deadly attack with both of these rooks uh, and the bishop here on e5 to attack that king. So really the, the move of the game comes in this next move. And it's extremely difficult to find that the fact that uh, Zuckertort was able to find it. One of the reasons that this was his immortal game, but he founded the great move queen to b4 and says, yeah, go ahead and take my queen. I'm okay with that because all he cares about is the queen here on e7 cannot defend the square here on e5. So if the queen were to take, which he didn't, uh, then the bishop could come up here to e5, and then there would be a mate. It would be quite a few moves, but knowing that he played the move queen to b4, uh, you're led to believe that he knew what the, the mate would be because he has all of his active pieces. And this queen's completely shut out. Is over on the queen side, can't really do too much, and he could just continue to check his opponent, and eventually he would have a checkmate on the board so after queen to b4 says yeah go ahead and take my queen blackburn says yeah i'm not going to do that plays rook down here to c5 then we have rook up to f8 check says please go ahead and take my rook now i tried to have you take my queen you didn't i want you to go ahead and take my rook now he does not decide to go ahead and take the pawn right here if he takes with his queen it's not going to be good. Same thing as we saw before. Bishop takes on e5. Check. Uh, the queen is no longer defending it. Now you almost are forced to take with your, your king here. Uh, but then queen over to e4. Check. And then over time, this is going to be a checkmate. There's no way for black to stop this. So in the game, does not take the rook right away. Decides to go ahead and take with his king here on h7. Queen to e4. Then we have king to g7. Bishop to e5 and just really telling him, hey, I'm going to force you to take my material here. So the king takes on f8 and then we have yet another brilliant move. It seems like every single move that Zuckertort does is phenomenal, but he finds a great move with a deflection and that is bishop to g7.
And there's so many reasons that this is good. One, it's check, so black has to worry about that right away. If he takes with his king, we can see right away that the queen is going to take here on e7. Check, the bishop could fall. There's just nothing good that's going to happen for black here. He's going to lose that. Uh, but if he takes with his bishop, or excuse me, with his queen, uh, okay, still, it's going to be checkmate right away. Queen up here to e8, this is checkmate. So there's just no good way for black to deal with this. He decides to play king to g8, trying to do something in the game, but then queen to e7, uh, and at this point, there's really no way to stop this. You can delay the moves uh, by coming down here, checking your opponent, but there's no way to eventually checkmate the opponent. So at the end of the day, we have Blackburn decided to forfeit the game, and Zekertort won this game. Ended up winning the tournament, had an amazing display. If you're playing this high level, you would expect him, even with the best players in the world, including Steinitz, to go ahead and win uh, the tournament, which he did. So phenomenal game, especially towards the end, finding all these moves that are extremely difficult to find. And it all started when he realized, yes, I'm going to attack the center of the board. I'm going to let you do your thing over on the queen side uh, and really dominating with his bishop pair. Well, we talk so many times about having that bishop pair and putting it to use. That's exactly what he did. Uh, and then knowing that he had that that discovered attack here, just moving his pawn up to d5 and blowing up the king side of the board in those pawns so that he eventually could uh, unleash that strong attack on his opponent. So uh, this was a phenomenal game to review. Always love seeing that the games from hundreds of years ago of these players who are still playing at such a high level. Uh, I, I feel like some of these immortal games we don't get to see of as much uh, nowadays, but it is always good to, to look at some of these older games. If there are other games you would like me to review, feel free to let me know. Uh, you can email me at any time at the chess website at gmail.com. But thank you guys so much for watching Zekertor It's Immortal, one of the best games uh, of all time. So always good to go back and look at these. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.